Hopefully by now you know that globalization has led to increased connections from people from around the world. This has made us interdependent. We literally depend on each other to prosper. Today we're going to look at the evolution of economic globalization in the last century. Every country wants to have sustainable development. This means you want your economy to grow, but in a way that ensures the economy can continue to grow in the future, in order to ensure prosperity for people today and the next generation. The idea of prosperity can focus on material goods, your standard of living, or it can also include your quality of life, your social relationship and environment. Governments must make decisions that will impact the sustainable development of their citizens. In recent history, as opposed to ancient history, the ideas of capitalism evolved. During the Middle Ages, we didn't have countries like we do now. Instead, small regions were controlled by a powerful ruler who would promise the local people security in exchange for financial support. So the ruler would provide the knights and a castle to hide in if you came under attack, and in return the peasants would work the land and pay taxes. The ruler was allowed to tell people where they could work and what job they'd do. Over time, this evolved as those rulers became more powerful, turning into kings. We say that the economy was a mercantilist system because the king could control the merchants in order to ensure that the monarchy always had enough money to have strong armies. By the 1700s, people started to question this. That famous philosopher Adam Smith outlined the ideas of modern capitalism. He said the government shouldn't be controlling the economy because the wealth of the nation wasn't in how much gold the king had, but could be found in all of the goods and services produced by the people. He argued that anyone should be allowed to start a business they want, and the invisible hand will control the economy instead of the king. Eventually these ideas led to the Industrial Revolution, all of which we looked at in the last unit as it promoted imperialism, historical globalization. After World War II, many governments realized that with this laissez-faire capitalism, a poor economy can lead to the rise of support for extreme political ideas like fascism and communism to fix their problems. So they decided to come together to encourage trade with each other to prevent that instability between countries. They believed that a capitalist system where the citizens of a country are free to trade with each other would encourage greater world peace. At Bretton Woods, 44 nations came together and signed agreements that created the World Bank and the IMF, or International Monetary Fund. The World Bank helps developing nations to get loans from a fund that's funded by developed nations. This can help a developing nation to strengthen their economy and encourage international trade, which has an impact on global peace because you don't usually go to war with somebody you're trading with. In order to get a loan from the World Bank, the government of that developing nation must agree to reduce their debt try to eliminate corruption in their government, and establish a more capitalist economy in order to minimize the economic costs to the government for social programs. All of these ideas were supported and promoted by economists like Hayek and Friedman. Similar to the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund can also provide emergency loans to countries, but they're usually more short term. And like the World Bank, the IMF will require the borrowing nation state to implement more capitalist policies to help pay back the debt. But the IMF also monitors currencies to help us determine what that currency is worth. That helps to encourage international trade because you want to make sure you're getting a fair price for the goods. But how would you know if you didn't know the value of their currency compared to yours? The WTO started as GATT, or the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which worked to establish free trade, trade that's free from tariffs or other regulations that inhibit international trade. For centuries, countries have charged a tax on imports as a way to make money and to make foreign goods more expensive so that their citizens will buy domestically produced goods. But capitalists feel this gets in the way of international trade because money is being moved out of the economy by the government, and the WTO members support this. Today, members of the WTO must abide by various agreements to encourage international trade, and there's a panel that can help to mediate conflicts between member nations. Are there any current WTO issues that Canada is dealing with? There are other organizations that encourage this idea of trade liberalization. Two key trade blocks, a block is a group of countries that work together, notice how it's spelled, are NAFTA, initially the FTA between Canada and the US, but in 1994 it was expanded to include Mexico, and the second is the EU, which grew out of the European Economic Community, which was a common market established under the 1957 Treaty of Rome. Both of these trade agreements have their pros, like the fact that it encourages trade between neighbors. It expands already successful programs like the Auto Pact that allowed car parts to be made in either the US or Canada without any tariffs being added. And when it's easier to trade goods, it often means more jobs, which helps to promote sustainable economic development. But the con is that those jobs are now easier to move around, so companies will set up factories in areas that have cheaper labor costs, and workers can migrate to countries that pay people more. But that then increases the number of people in the labor force, which can lead to wages going down. 
What are some current events that relate to NAFTA or the EU? All of these agreements encourage trade liberalization, which has increased economic globalization. Transnational or multinational corporations have become a way of life. Communication technology means that I can have my head office in Canada, my factories in China, and my support center in India. Why would I have my call support center in India? Because many people in that country speak English due to the past British colonization. And often people in North America want to call for help in the evening when North American employees are at home. So it's cheaper and easier to have your call center employees on the other side of the world where it's the middle of the day. Transportation technology means that it's much easier and cheaper to ship goods around the world, which is why it makes sense for my company to be making products in China. Have you ever seen a major port like Vancouver with those stacks of transportation containers? Those containers were revolutionary in the past and in some developing countries today. When you wanted to transport something over long distances, you'd have to load it in a truck, then unload it to load it in the rail car, and then once you got the, to the port, you had to unpack it again to pack it into the ship and then repeat the whole procedure all over again in the new location. A hundred years ago in North America, there were thousands of stevedores who were men who worked in the ports to load and unload goods. Now there's a fraction of the number of stevedores needed to be paid because you can pack your goods into a container that's put on the truck, then moved onto the train, then loaded onto the ship without ever unpacking a thing. It's revolutionary.